Now let's get into the concept of a very interesting or the most interesting part under India's 19, which deals with post-employment or retirement benefits and other long-term benefits. Now, why are these so interesting? I'll tell you. Let's take the best example of a gratuity. How do you calculate gratuity? Gratuity, Payment of Gratuity Act, if you remember, even you had a particular uh, part of Income Tax Act under Salaries Chapter, which was dealing with payment of gratuity. So, when you talk about gratuity, gratuity is calculated as 15 days of salary or half month salary for every completed year of service or part thereof. So, that means a 15 days, let's say I'm taking 15 days salary, 15 days of salary for every completed year of service or part thereof. If I use this language, if I'm using this language, let's say an employee X has completed first year, then his gratuity obligation, the enterprise obligation to pay gratuity to Mr. X is increased by half month salary already. If he completes two years, then it is two times half month salary obligation has already arisen. Third year when he completed, it became three times half month salary. Fourth year when he completed, four times half month salary. So like this, by every completed year of service, the obligation of payment of gratuity to my employee keeps on increasing. It keeps on increasing every year. But this obligation of payment of gratuity will only arise if the employee has completed five years and has retired from the organization or has left employment. If he leaves employment after five years, then this benefit of gratuity is available or the obligation arises to the enterprise. Now my concept is, every year since there is an obligation to the enterprise which is increasing, I'll have to create a provision. Very good. When I create a provision, how long you should create? As long as he's in, he's in employment. But these amounts which are created have to be set aside and utilized for a further period, correct? So whenever I create a provision, let's say the enterprise has earned a profit of 100 rupees, out of which the employer has created a provision to the extent of 10 rupees. What is the cash profit? 100. But what is the profit after the provision? 90. That means this 10 rupees of provision that you created is a non-cash expenditure which is debited to PNL. Such non-cash expenditure debited to PNL, I'll have to park it somewhere. Why should I park it somewhere? Apply logic. Depreciation. I'll go back to that concept. If you remember depreciation, we had a concept called a sinking fund. Why do you create sinking fund? Because depreciation is a non-cash expenditure and depreciation is trying to create sufficient funds for replacement of asset at the end of its useful life. Every year, I'll pull out depreciation from the profit and I'll keep it somewhere. If I put it in my draw, ultimately there's no profit or there's no addition which is happening. So what do I do? Every year the concept of depreciation which is pulled out from there, I will take it and I will make sure that this amount is invested elsewhere. If I keep on investing like this, there is a certain amount of return which I'll keep on getting on this. Clear? That's why you have a sinking fund reserve on the liability side and a sinking fund investment on the asset side. Same logic you apply here. Every year I create a provision towards payment of bonus to employees. And this provision which I create towards payment of employees has to be invested because this fund is necessary only when the employee is leaving the organization. When is the employee going to leave the organization? Sometime in future. So therefore, I will have to make sure that these funds are parked somewhere so that it gives me some return on investment. So that sufficient amount is, uh, is available to repay the employee when he leaves the employment. Clear? This is the underlying concept under your, uh, under your uh, uh, long term benefits or your post employment benefits. Clear? Whenever I talk about this post employment benefits, it requires complex calculation. Because it is 15 days of salary for every completed year of service into last drawn salary. What is the employee's last drawn salary? I don't know. If you ask me today, let's say an employee at the age of 25 has joined your organization. Today he has already completed five years of service. 
this gratuity obligation of 15 days of every completed year of service is multiplied by 5 number of years of completed service into last drawn salary what is his last drawn salary he is not leaving the organization today when will he leave the organization sir probably at the age of his 60 what will be his last drawn salary at the age of 60 i don't know that is why these calculations are quite complicated not just to understand for us but also in practical sense these are quite complicated calculation so let's see what we have under the concept of long term benefits or post retirement post employment benefits which are offered to the employees my post employment benefits are basically categorized into two classes or classified broadly into two categories the first category is called as defined contribution plan what do you mean by defined contribution plan where the contribution made by the employer towards the employee's benefit is fixed, is defined. What is defined means fixed. So the employee's contribution towards payment of benefit to an employee is fixed. Best example is provident fund. Provident fund, what do you do? The provident fund benefits are available to the employee only after a certain period of time or when he leaves the organization. So what will happen? The employer will contribute a certain portion of the salary of the employee as provident fund contribution from himself. He will deduct a portion from the employee, he will contribute his part and he will deposit it into the employee's PF account. Clear? So here in this case, the employer's obligation is limited, is limited to the contribution made by the employee or to the maximum extent of 12% of his salary. As simple as that. So we are saying in a defined contribution plan, which is also a part of defined uh, sorry, post employment benefits, the employer's contribution towards payment of benefit to the employee is limited, is fixed, is determined, is defined. Clear? In this case, it becomes very simple accounting treatment because whatever is the employee's contribution payable should be recognized as an expense. So therefore, in the PNL, I will debit employer's contribution to provident fund directly in the face of PNL as a staff cost. Clear? But the most interesting concept arises when you talk about defined benefit plan. What are your defined benefit plan? Gratuity. The benefit received by the employee is defined. Employee knows I will get 15 days salary for every completed year of service based on my last drawn salary. The employee knows this benefit, how much he will get. But in the case of provident fund, the employee does not know because the employee only knows that certain amount got contributed. On that, there is a certain amount of interest. How much will I get based on the accumulation? But defined benefit plan, the employee very well knows how much he will get. He will say 15 days of salary I will get uh, for number of years I have spent in the organization based on my last drawn salary. So what is the last drawn salary that I don't know? So in such cases, your defined benefit plan requires a lot of complex calculations. To manage these kind of complexities, not just for accounting purposes, but even for management to make an estimate, it requires certain complex calculations. That's why they have to plan this obligation. How do they plan? Employer plans this obligation in a particular manner. There are three ways in which the employer can plan his obligation. Number one. Multi-employer plan. Why does this concept of multi-employer plan come into picture? Like I told you, every year the employer contributes or makes a certain provision for payment of gratuity to employee. This provision that he makes has to be invested in a certain manner so that he derives maximum benefit from that money. Now, if I invest, let's say I invested in stock market. Suddenly stock market collapsed. What will happen? My entire investment is waved up. So that means to make this kind of investment, I need someone who is knowledgeable to handle this fund. Who is this person who is knowledgeable? They are called as fund managers. They are called as fund manager to whom all these funds are given and I give him the responsibility of managing the fund in such a way that he derives benefit to the employee. He derives benefit to the enterprise. But one employer alone may not be having a fund manager to manage all these funds. 
because these fund managers are quite costly. So how will I afford a fund manager when my fund size is very small? If you're talking about companies like Infosys, Reliance, Tata, huge enterprises, big enterprises, for them they can have, they can afford a fund manager. But it is not necessary for every small enterprise to afford a fund manager. So what they will do for better management of funds to employ an efficient fund manager, multiple employers will come together and will say, my current year provision is 100. What is your current year provision? My current year provision is 80. What is your current year provision? My current year provision is 250. Like this, four or five or even more employers will come together. They will pool their funds and they'll give it to the fund manager. The fund manager will now try to allocate these funds into multiple investments, certain government securities, certain fixed deposits, certain risky investments like mutual funds, units of mutual fund or units of equity shares. Like this, the fund manager will try to allocate the funds in such a way that these funds will derive maximum benefit. So multi-employer plans are famous because each employer may not be capable enough to meet the requirements of the fund manager. Each employer may not have sufficient funds to employ the fund manager himself. So he is collaborating with multiple other employers to afford this fund manager. First, second one, easy one, state plan. State plans are normally run by central governments or state governments, generally by the central government. So where the benefits of the plan are basically that the each employer to his extent of the provision will directly be given to the state plan. Under state plan, the state, uh, the government entity will normally uh, place the funds into government deposits or government bonds where the rate of interest is slightly low but ultimately you need to understand that it is the most affordable case because state plans are very cheap to subscribe. Third, most famous 99% of enterprises today to manage their defined benefit plans have gone into insured benefit plan. What is an insured benefit plan? Under insured benefit plan, logic is very simple. Employer has a risk. What risk? To pay employment benefits under po uh, sorry post employment benefits to the employee whenever he leaves the organization. When he leave, uncertain. What is his last drawn salary? Uncertain. So much of uncertainty is there. These uncertainties have to be borne by the employer. The employer has to absorb these uncertainties. But the employer is saying, sir, I should do my business. I can't absorb all this. Tomorrow suddenly an employer leaves and employee will leave and he'll say, pay my gratuity. I may not have sufficient funds because my funds are already utilized in particular manner. So what I'll do, I'll go to an insurance company. The business of insurance company is to absorb risk, absorb uncertainty. Since there's an uncertainty, I'll go to the insurance company and I'll say, See, I have these employees. They might leave the organization at any point of time. There are certain benefits which are payable to these employees. And the benefits payable to these employees, I've given them in an order. The insurance company will calculate and he'll say, you subscribe to this particular plan. If you subscribe to this insured benefits plan by paying an insurance premium, tomorrow you don't have to bear the burden. Whenever an employee retires, you just tell him to contact me. I will pay that employee benefit to the employee. Your risk of paying employment benefit is completely over. You don't have to pay those benefits any longer. It is the insurance company which will absorb the risk of pay making the payment. Clear? In such case, the employer need not recognize any employee benefit at all. Because today the employee benefit is an obligation of the insurance company for which I pay as an employer an insurance premium. That premium amount which I paid to the insurance company, I will write directly recognize it as expense. So that means by subscribing to an insured benefit plan, a defined benefit obligation of the employer has now become defined contribution plan. Because the employer contributes only the insurance premium over. After I contribute insurance premium, whatever employee benefit is payable, it will be the insurance company which will pay it. So the risk and the obligation is the insurance company's risk and insurance company's obligation. 
it is no longer the company's obligation or the enterprise obligation therefore i don't recognize it as defined benefit plan anymore i will now recognize it as defined contribution plan clear so to manage the defined benefit plan to manage the benefits payable to the employees under defined benefit plans the employer can choose either of these three methods either he can go for multi employer plan where with multiple employers he will get into a collaboration to pool their funds and to appoint a fund manager to manage this fund number 2 easy one go to the central government tell them that i have an obligation i am depositing this money you use this money and give me a return state plan insured benefit plan i'll go to the insurance company and tell him that this is the obligation which i have this is the uncertainty which i have this is the risk which i have you take out the risk you tell me how much i have to pay you today the insurance company will calculate a premium and the employer will pay the premium once the employer paid the premium the employer no longer has an obligation to pay these benefits it will be the obligation of the insurance company to pay these benefits therefore your defined benefit plan has become a defined contribution plan now clear these are management of post employment benefits so this is a multi employer plan where multiple employers come together to subscribe to a particular plan where they pool their resources and they employ a fund manager who will take the responsibility of managing the fund in such a way that they maximize the return on these monies invested so pooling of resources from all employers to manage the fund and make them available for payment of benefit when they actually fall due in short benefits plan the risk of the em employment benefits is available is on the employer the employer by paying an insurance to the, uh, by paying a premium to the insurance companies transfers the risk of employee benefits also to the insurance company so whenever the benefits fall due the employee is going to receive the money from the insurance company itself so therefore under insured benefit plan the defined benefit plan of the employer converts into a defined contribution plan since the risk associated to employee benefits are transferred to the insurance company therefore only the insurance premium paid to the insurance company will be recognized as expense in the pnl no other provision is required to be created all those provisions required to be created for employee benefits will be created by the insurance company no longer by the employer under a state plan the employer contributes to the fund uh, the fund to a state plan which monitors the fund and makes funds necessary to pay the obligation when the amount falls due clear so until now we are only talking about how do we manage this multiple uh, 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 how do we manage this defined benefit plans which are payable to the employee at a future date whenever there is a post employment or other long term benefits so we said we will manage the fund either by post multi employer plan state plan or insured benefit plan so forget about insured benefit plan from here on because insured benefit plan i told you there is no risk of the employer there is no obligation on the employer there is no uncertainty to the employer because the employer transferred the risk uncertainty to the insurance company by subscribing to a policy he will only pay the premium on the policy such premium will be charged to the pnl as an expense but now we will have to discuss about what if the employer himself is managing these employee uh, employee benefits or these funds made available to the employee benefits let's see what happens in this case
we will get into the most important concept of how to recognize and measure defined benefit plans defined contribution plans or insured benefit plan like i told you whatever is the employee employer's contribution to a defined contribution plan or whatever is the employer's insurance premium he is paying to the insured benefit plan these have to be recognized as expense in the pnl and that is the only accounting treatment if i make a contribution employer's contribution to pf which is a defined contribution plan what is the entry that you record employer's contribution to provident fund to bank that employer's contribution to provident fund should be charged to pnl pnl to employer employer's contribution to provident fund over if i go for an insured benefit plan the defined benefit obligation has become defined contribution plan so what will happen in such case the insurance premium paid should be charged off to pnl insurance premium to bank pnl to insurance premium these are simple accounting treatments but when i talk about where the man where the employer himself is managing the risk where the employer himself is parking the funds where the employer himself is subscribing to a multi employer plan where the employer himself is subscribing to a state plan he to make funds necessary whenever the benefits have to be paid we will have to look at a sequence of accounting treatments it is not as easy as it looks so let's see what are the multiple accounting treatments necessary whenever you have a multi employer plan or a state plan or where the employer himself is managing the risk under a defined benefit plan you have two types of things first one is defined benefit obligation what is the defined benefit obligation the obligation to pay my employee the employment benefits when they fall due under defined benefit plan clear that is the obligation or the liability to the employer so whenever i talk about this obligation of the employer to pay benefits to the employee when they fall due i call this as defined benefit obligation or in simple terms i can call it as plan obligation but this obligation is not paid at the end of each year but it is provided at the end of each year that means you are only creating a provision just like sinking fund this funds which are set aside for the purpose of meeting employer obligation in future i will park these funds into a separate investment sinking fund reserve sinking fund investment same way defined benefit obligation i will invest somewhere into something called as plan assets plan asset is an investment portfolio of the enterprise to ensure sufficient funds are made available to meet the obligation of paying employment benefits when they fall due clear so i'm saying i have an obligation where the obligation is called as plan obligation or defined benefit obligation the obligation to pay my employment benefits when they fall due this amount is not due yet it is not supposed to be paid yet so these funds i will pull them aside i'll invest it and these investments are called as plan assets so when i record an entry i'll record pnl to provision and i will invest this funds so plan asset or investment account debit to bank so in this way i create a liability or an obligation i'll also create an asset clear now what is the recognition let's see there are five recognitions which i do under obligation under your defined benefit plan there are five recognitions which i do current service cost interest cost return on plan assets actual gain or loss i'll repeat current service cost interest cost return on plan assets actual gain or loss and the last one is called as curtailments settlements and past service cost there are three different things but i will deal them separately so i am leaving this fifth part aside i am first concentrating on the first four current service cost interest cost return on plan assets and actual gain or loss what are these four components first first one current service cost is an increase in present value of defined benefit obligation arising from employee service in the current reporting period what is interest cost it is increase increase in the present value of defined benefit obligation since the investment is one year closer or uh, since the settlement is one year closer nothing you understood from the definition i know that 
So let's take a practical illustration to understand what is a current service cost and interest cost. Take this example. Let's say the defined benefit to an employee is number of years of service into last drawn salary per month. Let's say this is the defined benefit obligation to an employee. I'm just taking some example case. Don't ask me whether which, what is this gratuity or what anything else. This is my defined benefit plan. I'm taking number of years of service into last drawn salary per month is the defined benefit plan to employee. Let's say the employee's salary today per month is 10,000. And every year it is expected to increase by 5%. Let's say the number of years of service of the employee is 5. I don't know whether it is 5 or it could be 30 also. But for the purpose of illustration or example, I am taking it as 5 years. And let's say the discount rate is 10%. So that means the benefits payable to the employee are falling due at the end of the fifth year based on his last drawn salary into number of years of service that is 5 years. So what is his last drawn salary? Each year it will increase by 5%. Current it is 10,000. Next year it will be 10,000 plus 5%. That next year it will be 10,000 plus 5% plus 5%. Like this, 5% will increase over 4 years. At the end of the 5th year, I will calculate a salary as 12,155. Increasing it by 5% every year. You use your calculator and get it. 10,000 now. Next year how much it will be? Into 1.05. Next year it will become 10,500. That is year 2 salary. Year 3 salary, 1.05 again multiply. Third year salary will become 11,025. Fourth year salary will become 11,576. Fourth year salary, fifth year salary will become 12,155.0625 rounded off to 12,155. That will be the last drawn salary per month of the employee. Clear? How much of benefit is payable? Last drawn salary multiplied by 5. That means 60,775 rupees of benefit is payable to the employee at the end of fifth year. Clear? Now, at the end of first year, I'll first have to create a provision because I know that the obligation arises at the end of fifth year. So each year I have to create a provision. As he completes first year of service, the obligation is 1 into last drawn sum. As I complete second year of service, the obligation is 2 into last drawn salary. As I complete third year of salary, it is 3 into last drawn salary. Like this, the provision keeps on increasing every year. Correct? So first year, when I create a provision, for uh, first look at this concept. So total amount I have to pay at the end of fifth year is 60,755. Correct? So divided by 5, each year I will have to create a provision of 12,151. Each year I will have to create a pro provision of, second guys, 175, right? 775 divided by 5. Each year I will have to create a provision of 12,151. So when I create 12,151 of provision each year, understand, first year, when I create 12,151, the amount is not payable at the end of the current year. It is payable at the end of fifth year. So therefore, I will have to provide it on a discounted basis at present value. So at the end of first year, when I create 12,155, it is to be paid at the end of the fifth year. Therefore, it should be discounted by four years. By four years? At the end of first year, you create a provision to pay at the end of fifth year. So that means end of first year to end of fifth year, only four years discounting is necessary. So since discount factor is 10%, so present value factor of 10 comma 4 into 12,155. Look at the current service cost. Current service cost is 8,302 at the end of first year. Second year. Again, I'll create 12,155 provision at the end of second year. But since this amount is payable at the end of fifth year, I'll discount it by three years. Amount came up to 9,128. Third year, when I create a provision for 12,155, Discounted by 2 years. Amount will come down to 10,045. Fourth year provision will come down to 11,050. Last year 12,155 because there is no discounting. The amount falls due at the end of fifth year. 
clear now look at what is the interest cost then interest cost is because look at 8302 first year current service cost you created a provision of 8302 in year at the end of year 1 to make sure that the payment becomes 12155 at the end of fifth year how will it become 12155 at the end of fifth year just like that it won't become so therefore every year since you are coming closer to settlement you have to keep on increasing the amount of provision so first year uh, when i created 8302 second year i have to create an interest cost of 8330 on that second year again i'll create a current service cost of 9128 and my closing provision will become 18260 that is the present value of the obligation at the end of year 2 when you come to year 3 again interest cost should be calculated on the opening provision becomes 1826 third year current service cost is 10045 therefore it becomes 30131 at the end of third year like this if you keep on repeating your calculations at the end of fifth year your obligation of 60755 should arise it became 60768 because of approximation 7 rupees short okay but otherwise this is a simple calculation which shows interest cost as well as your current service cost now you look at the definition what is current service cost the increase in present value of defined benefit obligation every year your obligation towards payment of uh, post employment benefit to employee increases so the increase is not in current terms but it should be in present value terms because the obligation is to be settled at a future date so increase in present value of defined benefit obligation arising from the employee service in the current reporting period since he completed the first year i created a provision of 8302 since he completed next year again i create 9128 since he completed third year i created 10045 these are increase in present value of defined benefit obligation because the employee has completed his service in the current reporting period what is interest cost since i recognize the current service cost on a present value basis as it comes closer to the settlement date interest should be catching up on the provision and this catch up of interest is called as interest cost it is the increase in present value of defined benefit obligation since the settlement is one year closer remember even under india 16 when we discuss about present value of uh, estimated dismantling cost every year i keep increasing the provision because not because of amount estimated change because as it keeps on coming closer to the day on which it has to be met i have to keep on increasing the interest such interest increase is called as interest cost so four aspects i told you under defined benefit plan current service cost interest cost return on plan asset and actual gain or loss out of these four first two i covered and i am saying it is current service cost and interest cost increase in present value of defined benefit obligation arising from employee service in the current reporting period is called as current service cost the increase in obligation arising due to the settlement coming one year closer is called as interest cost these are the first two aspects which i help you with the i which i gave you with the help of an example i illustrate clear guys in general sense these calculations are more complex because here i took it as only 5 years it became easy if i take 25 years then obviously you have to use an excel sheet to get this answer it is not possible to use your calculator to get dance clear what is this return on plan asset a return on plan asset is called as expected return on plan asset what is expected return expected return is nothing but the interest and dividend on plan assets because plan assets are investments these investments can yield return in the form of interest or dividend can also yield in the form of capital appreciation so that's why unrealized gain or loss on plan assets minus fund administration cost what is this fund administration cost there's a fund manager the fund manager requires to have some percentage or his commission or his salary that is called as fund administration cost so interest plus 
uh, interest or dividend on plan asset plus increase in the uh, in the value of that plan asset minus fund administration cost is equal to expected return always calculate expected return as a percentage apply it on the plan asset and that is called as return on plan assets this return on plan asset should be credited to pn the first two which i discussed about interest and interest cost and current service cost should be debited to pnl while your return on plan asset should be credited to pn what is to be credited to pnl is called as expected return on plan asset it is not actual return it is only expected return clear three things are covered now i'll bring up the most important concept called as actuarial gain or loss what is this actuarial gain or loss and why does this arise